Hello, and thank you for uh, having us uh, uh, to, to provide our comment. I would, I, I would like to add my voice to the chorus here today in opposition to this ridiculous resolution. At a time when the rest of the world is condemning Israel for committing war crime after war crime, Chicago is fiddling around on whether to condemn Hamas. By doing so, Chicago will be doing its part in enabling the genocide of Palestinians. And this resolution acts like it's on the side of innocent civilians. So in that case, I'd like to add, are you considering a resolution condemning Israel for what, using white phosphorus against the civilian population? Are you considering condemning Israel for its planned war crime of forced removal of one million Palestinians from northern Gaza? Are you going to condemn them for cutting off food, water, and electricity to Gaza? Another war crime called collective punishment. Did it ever cross your mind to condemn Israel when they assassinated Palestinian journalist Shireen Abu Akleh in broad daylight or when they brutalized the people carrying her coffin peacefully or when Israeli snipers killed innocent peaceful protesters throughout the March of Return? Did the people in office before you ever consider condemning Israel at any point since its inception would it cram a country full of people into a 60 mile corner of their own country creating the largest concentration camp in history, the largest open air prison in the world? The answer is a resounding no. You never considered it, nor did your ancestors. But unfortunately for you, times have changed. The world is increasingly aware of the crimes of Israel and increasingly aware of the framework of politicians who enable their continued apartheid by resolutions such as these. And in a city like Chicago, with majority black and brown people who have experienced the apartheid-like conditions of oppression in the United States, a generation of young people have emerged who understand immediately that we have everything in common with the Palestinian people and nothing in common with the brutal Zionists under who they suffer. A generation of people who are not surprised when we find out that our politicians, up to our president, spread lies about 40 babies being beheaded in order to rationalize genocide. We're only surprised that they're forced to walk those lies back. But of course, the damage is done. People are still spewing the debunked lies about rape and massacre of babies, even here in this very meeting when actually there is endless evidence of Israel having killed over 500 babies in the last 48 hours alone, having dropped more bombs in 24 hours than the U.S. dropped on Afghanistan in one year. And finally, let it be known that condemning the attack as the actions of some fringe group misses the point of what's going on. The attacks were carried out by a broad coalition of groups from every section of Palestinian society, not just Hamas. That coalition represents a people determined to attain freedom at any cost, and they have arrived at this point in the face of a broad coalition of right-wing Zionists and their supporters like those in the city council who would start a meeting with a prayer calling for their attempt at freedom, a second Holocaust where I'm so silent you could hear a rat piss on cotton when innocent, peaceful Palestinians are annihilated day in and day out like the Native Americans of this country. If it were another time, these same people would be condemning Africans for rebelling against their slave masters during slavery, such as Nat Turner or in the Haitian Revolution. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, thank you, please, thank you, please. Welcome to Fight Back Radio, production of fightbacknews.org, taking you to the heart of the people's struggle. And today's guest, uh, you may have seen on social media already, he's become very popular for his... Uh, what he's been putting up uh, on different things about um, uh, Palestine and what's been going on there. But uh, our episode today is about uh, the Black Liberation Movement and the Palestinian Liberation Movement. Um, the guest is uh, Marawi Garima, uh, who is uh, um, a leader in the Black Liberation Movement. He's uh, the co-chair of the Campaign to Free Incarcerated Survivors of Torture, which is a uh, one of the campaigns of the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression. And the other co-chair you may have heard on Fight Back Radio as well, Jasmine Smith. Um, so and if you haven't, I'd, I'd uh, encourage you to go back and check that one out because it talks more about the campaign. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, black liberation and Palestine. And uh, uh, Marawi uh, gives us a, a, an analysis that... Uh, you know, it seems illogical after hearing him that black people would not support uh, the Palestinian liberation struggle and uh, the importance of uh, unconditional support for all liberation struggles from all people of conscious across the planet. So uh, I think it's a, a, a good interview. Um, also, I want to mention uh, Marawi, besides his le being a leader of the black liberation movement, 
is an up and coming filmmaker. <clears throat> and I think we may have him back sometime soon to talk about film and the movement and stuff like that. But I'd encourage you uh, to go to Netflix and check out his latest uh, film called Residue. And uh, it's, it's quite good. And uh, he's quite talented. You'll see that uh, besides being a great leader of our movement. So uh, um, here he is, uh, Marawi Garima. So I'm here with uh, Marawi Garima, who uh, has, you know, been an activist in the black community for a long, long time. But recently you've become uh, uh, somewhat of a, a star on social media through some of these reels that you've made um, regarding uh, the situation in Palestine. Could you tell us a little bit about, uh, you know, why you made those reels and uh, you know, how that came to be, how you came to have a, a passion for Palestine? Well, I mean, I don't know if I would say star, you know, it's funny. Um, it actually, the way it started was we, you know, they, there was a situation at city hall, um, near the beginning of, of all this, you know, not too long after October 7th, where essentially, um, Alder, I think Silverstein was putting forward a resolution to have, you know, um, city council vote on, you know, denouncing Hamas and, you know, all that that kind of stuff. And essentially, um, you know, we all went down there to uh, to basically just kind of voice our concerns of the fact that they were, you know, kind of chomping at the bit to to denounce, you know, the, the you know, Palestinian resistance, but had nothing to say about, you know, the genocide, which was already in full swing by that point. And so, you know, I made public comment, um, you know, through Another another, you know, comrade in the Chicago Alliance, uh, Gabe Miller, who got a speaking slot, gave his slot to me. So I was able to make comments over the phone. And um, those comments ended up going viral on social media. And uh, that's kind of how it all started, you know. Um, so this is a Chicago City Council, uh, Alderman Silverstein, who's a you know, well-known uh Zionist, uh, uh, you know, in the council, uh, probably the most hardcore of that. And um, so, okay, so you made uh, uh, these statements uh, that went viral. What, what did you say? What, were, what was, uh, for those uh, of our Fight Back Radio listeners that haven't seen your uh, um, your clip, what, what, what did you say there? I mean, the main thing was just point out the contradiction between, you know, the fact that they were, you know, again, like had nothing to say about what Israel was doing up to that point. They had already dropped more bombs on um, it, on uh, Palestine than the United States had had, had dropped on uh, Afghanistan, you know, in a year. And, you know, they had already killed, I think, 500 children, you know what I mean, up to that, I think in one day or up to that point. You know what I mean? It was kind of all this talk about, oh, you know, the civilians that have been kind of murdered, you know, by Palestinian, you know, demonizing them as, you know, subhumans and all that kind of stuff, but had nothing to say about, you know, um, these, uh, you know, civilians who were being slaughtered, you know, at that point, you know, the white phosphorus, the force removal, you know, all those things. And and also just to connect it up with the way that they talk about all, you know, revolutionaries, you know, that we've ever, you know, known, you know, from Nat Turner to the Haitian Revolution, that, you know, they're labeled as terrorists, Malcolm X, you know, they're labeled as terrorists, somebody is you know, as, um, you know, uh, allegedly peaceful as, as um, Martin Luther King labeled as terrorist by some, you know what I mean? They use it, you know, um, when it, when it conveniences them. And so I just wanted to kind of connect up, you know, the fact that uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, they um, are um, facilitating genocide. You know, that's the point is that they were facilitating genocide. You know, that was the point of the resolution. Yeah, and uh, um, and but I thought your critique, uh, you know, it was it was uh, the parallel you drew, the one you just mentioned uh, was biting because you talked about a lot of the circumstances that are going on right now in Palestine, and uh, uh, but you also talked about, you know, at the end of uh, your comments, as I recall, you know, like as you said, Nat Turner and uh, you know, there was uh, you know people, you know, Denmark Vasey or whoever we would we would say that you know rebelled that you know people. You know, people that are now oppressors, uh, um, you know, they're willing to embrace them because they've been dead for a couple hundred years and they're not a threat. But uh, uh, you drew a parallel to those people and uh, the fight that Palestinians are having right now. You know, it's interesting. They actually they still don't, you know, um, they still, 
you know, accuse the Haitian revolution of terrorists. You know, they still talk about and more the fact that, you know, uh, women and children were killed, you know, by these, you know, Haitian revolutionaries, you know, again, glossing over the fact that they were presiding over a slave society, you know what I mean? That was ru ruled by and enforced by the most brutal, you know, violence for, you know, hundreds of years and would have gone a thousand more if these, these kinds of actions weren't undertaken, you know, um, by these folks, you know, at the, at, you know, in, in the Haitian revolution. And so they still cry about that shit, you know what I mean? And I think that at the end of the day, you know, it's, uh, it's also a matter of, you know, just kind of, you know, asking that, that age old question, you know, for whom, you know, and to whom, you know, when you label people terrorists, who's doing the labeling, you know what I mean? And, um, and what purpose does it serve? You know, one of the reels that, you know, I think is, is having a resurgence today that I posted was really just about pointing out the fact that the United States still has not labeled, you know, the KKK as a terrorist organization, you know what I mean? Yet they go, they go after every black organization, you know, and every, you know, organization, you know, pushing, you know, every, every Palestinian organization, every, you know, every, every liberation organization, they go after them with gusto, you know what I'm saying? But when it comes to labeling the Oath Keepers, you know, the Proud Boys, like all these other organizations, they, you know, they, um, they can't find their, you know, they, they can't find the will to do it. And of course it's because it's their, it's their cousins, it's them, you know, they're, 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 they're members of these same organizations. We know that the Chicago police department has publicly known members who are also members. I mean, has, has officers who are members of the Oath Keepers, you know what I'm saying? And other organizations, these are white supremacist, violent, you know, uh, white supremacist, racist organizations. And, um, even to get the city to take action against them is a whole process that we're only now developing the power to do, you know what I mean? Um, and uh, so it's just kind of, you know, these contradictions, you know, the crazy thing is that like the Palestinian resistance is gifting the entire planet, you know what I mean? And the, it's a gift of clarity, you know, it's bringing so much clarity to all these contradictions. You know, of course we did it in 2020, we brought so much clarity to, um, we, we pulled back the veil on so many things that were, you know, um, going on in the United States and kind of so many, um, you know, uh, reasons why, you know, our lives are the way that they are. And then now in 2023, 2023, the Palestinians are doing it, you know, even more so, you know what I mean? Really showing, you know, kind of where people stand and um, the connections between, you know, of course, all of our struggles. Um, so in 2020, you're talking about the, the aftermath of the George Floyd uh, murder, I think, and some of the rebellion that happened uh, happened there. And uh, I mean, a lot of people would, you know, uh, would say, uh, um, and I, I know you've been an activist in the black community for some time now. You're the co-chair of uh, CFIST, along with uh, Jasmine Smith, who... Uh, I just I'll give a plug here for Fight Back Radio. For those that didn't haven't heard our last episode, it was our guest was Jasmine who talked a lot about Seafist. So we won't go into it quite as much here with with you, uh, Marawi. But uh, um, but but the, uh, a lot of people in the black community would say, "Hey, we have enough problems." You know, here in Chicago, there's uh, you know they're they're taking uh, immigrants are taking money away from us for other things, and uh, you know Palestine is the other side of the world. Um, why, you know, you know, you should be, you know, why do you care about all that? You should be focused on, 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 uh, on your own and, uh, some of the problems that are going on there. How do you respond to that kind of, uh, discussion? Yeah. I mean, you know, you get that online. There's always people who are just like, you know, <clears throat> it's not our fight. You know what I mean? It's not our problem. Why would, you know, why should black people care and, and things like that? But, um, you know, the truth is that um, at the end of the day, one thing that this has brought clarity to is the fact that all of our struggles are interconnected because we're facing down the same enemy. You know what I mean? And, uh, you know, Palestine right now is in this this um, this uh, struggle with Israel, which is essentially, you know, this um, this uh, satellite, you know, kind of state, you know, uh, of the United States. You know, if you look at right now, Biden the fact that the Democrats are essentially willing to throw the election, they would rather lose the election than to, you know, lose Israel or to fold on Israel or to even just, you know, call for a ceasefire. Um, it kind of shows you um, that essentially, you know, the United States uh, is so, uh, it, it shows you how crucial 
Israel is to the United States ability, you know, to continue to dominate the planet. You know, it shows you how critical an element it is to, you know, U.S. imperial domination. And it's it's true. At the end of the day, it's through Israel that the United States is able to radiate influence, you know, uh, not only into the Middle East, but down into Africa, into North Africa, into uh, Central Africa, in the Congo, and down into Eastern Africa. You know, they, you know the, uh, the way that, you know, uh, the United States, uh, the way that Israel is such a prominent arms dealer in these in these issues that a lot of people bring up. They talk about, oh, why not Congo? Why not the Sudan? And like a lot of these weapons that are being used to like facilitate these genocides, you know, and these, um, you know, this mass movement of refugees across you know Africa are weapons that come straight out of Israel. You know, Israel is benefiting from these these um, these catastrophes in Africa. And, you know, of course, it's not. You know, it is true also that the United States radiates influence through AFRICOM, you know, all these military bases that they have in Africa. But before AFRICOM, there was Israel, you know what I mean? And um, and it doesn't stop there. It's also the, the it was described as the front gate of Asia. You know what I mean? Uh, Palestine is described as the front gate of Asia. It's through it's through that 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 quarter right there that they go into the Middle East and into the rest of the continent of Asia. You know what I mean? Especially also if you consider just the importance of the, um, you know, that kind of, um, you know, the, the Suez Canal right there in Egypt. Now they're trying to build a new canal to bypass the Suez Canal. You know, that's another kind of uh, aspect of the, the critical importance of of uh, of Palestine is they're trying to build another canal through Gaza, basically. You know what I'm saying? Um, the Ben Gurion Canal. That would allow them to not have to rely on Egyptian, you know, the Egyptian Suez Canal. And if that canal is so critical because it allows them to cut right through, you know, that that channel right there to get to Africa, to get to the rest of the world, you know, to move, you know, resources, troops, all those kinds of things. Otherwise, they have to go all the way around, you know, through, you know, all the way around Africa every time they wanted to move things from, you know, uh, from east to west. And so, uh, you know, it's tremendous. Uh, it, it allows them to maintain and continue to dominate and extract resources from these regions. And so it makes sense that they would rather lose an election than to lose Israel. You know what I mean? And, um, and they are able to send billions upon billions upon billions of dollars to Israel every year because they're receiving trillions, you know what I'm saying, back through that investment. You know what I mean? They don't so invest. What, <laughs> so what you seem to be saying, it, it's it's more than, you know, you're, you're laying out and correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a, uh, it's more than just a question of, of uh, morality. A lot of people around the world, um, their hearts have been broken by what, the, what they've seen on television of these the, the genocide. Um, but you're 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 going a little deeper than that, and that that's legit in itself. By the way, I don't want, mean to push that aside, but uh, um, but you're going a little deeper in talking about. Uh, how uh, uh, Israel's connection to, to United States imperialism is is dom, you know has oppressed people in different parts. You're not in Palestine for sure, but in different parts of the world. And you seem to be saying also uh, in the United black including black people in the United States. And uh, and I, I maybe I'm I don't want to put words in your mouth, but uh, uh, so that the solidarity of these different liberation movements makes sense because you have a common enemy. Is that does that Sum it up, or do you? I mean, put it in your Marawi's words instead of what I said. <laughs> well, I mean, well, look, you know, right now the Palestinian resistance is kicking one of the stools, one of the legs out of out of the stool of U.S. imperialism. You know what I mean? And it's as they, as the more they kick every blow that they deal, you know, it becomes the shakier that the United, you know, U.S. is uh, imperialist uh, position becomes, the easier it becomes for everybody else to also you know, gain room to also strike their own blows and to develop their movements further, you know? And I think that um, at the end of the day, um, black people in the United States are so oppressed because the United States is so able. And so um, so the, the United States is so able to effectively exploit and dominate and oppress black people here because they're able and uh, effectively exploiting the rest of the planet. You know what I mean? It is on the basis of the exploitation, exploitation of the rest of the rest of the planet that you know our misery, you know, kind of compiles, you know, year after year, year after year. And um, you know, I think that uh, the other thing is that you hear a lot is 
well, Arabs are racist towards black people, you know, or if you go over there, like you'll have a hard time because they don't like, you know, they're, they're, there's anti-blackness all over, all over the world and, and stuff like that, which is, you know, sure. You know what I mean? It's, it's, uh, it's absolutely a thing. It's absolutely a thing that has to be opposed, but what's the best way to address it? You know what I mean? What's the best way to address these racist attitudes and ideas out there in the world? The best way to address it is to address the actual material, you know, um, conditions that allow those ideas to exist. You know what I mean? And that that um, and that strengthen their their, um, you know, their function in the world. And right now, the single greatest you know, condition that allows racism to exist is American imperial domination of the planet is American imperialism, which benefits and utilizes these racist divisions to further its ability to, to, uh, you know, to, uh, to, to, uh, to dominate people. And as you know, you know, uh, divided we fall, you know, is the case because it is by dividing the world's people, you know, into these groups, into every group that it can, sexist division, you know, racist divi division, you know, uh, economic division, all these different ways of dividing people because it's in our unity, AKA it's in our solidarity, you know, that our greatest weapon exists to fight back against this, this thing which, uh, which oppresses us all. And, and in so doing, we also fight the basis, the real basis for racist ideas. You know what I mean? It's through solidarity, like Fred Hampton said, that we address racism. It's through solidarity that we build stronger ties with, you know, with the Arab world, you know what I mean? And address, you know, kind of these things that people complain about. It's not a reason to not take action. It's a reason to take action. It's a reason to stand in solidarity, you know? And I think that um, the, the worst thing that you can do in this moment is to climb up into your own, you know, specific, you know, uh, group, you know, your own community and just focus on yours, which is the national, the narrow nationalist tendency, you know, of a lot of black folks, you know, or some, let's say some black folks, actually a minority of black folks in this moment to just focus on black folks. That's the absolute worst thing that you, you, you can do, which, which really at, only at the end of the day only benefits a few black people anyway. You know, it doesn't actually bring up the whole group. It only benefits a few uh, select within that group. The best way to bring up, you know, the uh, the uh, the entire group is to stand in solidarity with other groups. And it's interesting because that's a fight that we face. You know, it's a question that we face here in Chicago as well, because I could, as you know, I'm a, a co-chair along with. Jasmine, like you said, who was a guest here, you know, last week, we could be like, yo, we have so much work to do around police crimes and around trying to fight to get these brothers out of prison. We should only focus on that. But actually, you know, the way forward is to find the way, despite the work that we have to do, which we cannot let go of around wrongful convictions in Chicago, but to tie ourselves, to attach ourselves to also this Palestinian liberation movement as well in supporting, you know, um, organization, you know, the CJP, which is the Palestinian Leadership of Chicago, you know, like USPCN, US uh, uh, Palestinian Community uh, Network um, to, you know, to strengthen their struggles, because they're also the people who stand shoulder to shoulder with us when it comes time to fight against police crimes and police brutality, you know, and, uh, and wrongful convictions in Chicago. You know, not only because it's, you know, them assisting us in our struggle, but because their community is subject to it, too. You know what I mean? Yep. Justice for Heidi is a case of this young boy who's brutalized, almost killed by the by, by police, you know, white police, racist police officers in uh, in, was Oakland. Yeah. South yeah. suburb of Chicago. Yes. Yeah. Um, Murad Kuti is another brother who was run run over by a drunken white woman and killed, struck by her car. She admitted to the police that she was drunk. They let her go, I think, without even taking a statement, without even, you know, kind of whatever. And then um, I think now she was finally, well, they had a court date where she was not even charged with his murder. She was charged with a minor traffic violation and had to pay, I think, like a $700-something fine which is just the most racist kinds of, uh, you know, kind of uh, it, it exposes the, the uh, in the best way, you know, the clearest way, the racism embedded within, you know, Chicago kind of justice system that everybody is subject to. And that for that reason, everybody has to stand together against, you know. And so it doesn't make sense for us to just focus on our work. It, it makes sense that, you know, in a situation of this gravity, of this magnitude, you know, uh, with implications for 
people around the planet that we do our part. So I, I want to ask you, uh, well, first, you know, I, I, um, uh, you're not just a person that gets, you know, that, you know, that does reels and videos, although you do that well. Um, uh, but you're an actual, you're an activist, you walk the walk. And uh, recently you were involved in an action at uh, Congresswoman Chakowsky's office. Um, and uh, I want to ask you about, uh, uh, and this was around Palestine, but what, you know, uh, um, you know, who was involved in that? Uh, how did you, uh, why did you pick Congresswoman Chakowsky? And could you tell our, our Fight Back Radio li- listeners a little bit about this action and what, what's happened as a result of it? Yeah, I mean, you know, that was another CJP action, you know what I mean, CJP led, where basically... So that's know, a coalition for justice in Palestine. Yeah, again, that's the Palestinian leadership in Chicago. Um, and, well, one, I'll just say that from day one, the Chicago Alliance, which is the organization I'm in, uh, the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, which is the Chicago chapter of the National Alliance, has from day one stood in you know total solidarity with the palestinian liberation movement you know what i mean and um so you know on that the you know that action that you're you're talking about cjp and um you know uspcn has been tussling with um this congresswoman shikowski for years you know i remember when i first got to chicago you know 2020 um they were talking about you know um their you know basically struggle to get her to take a stronger position you know on palestine and um so you know they've identified her as a pep you know pep which is the best acronym which basically stands for progressive except on palestine you know essentially saying that you know she talks so much talk around being progressive on all these issues but when it comes to actual you know um you know, genocidal occupation and apartheid, you know, in the world, she has nothing to say about it. Or in fact, she takes a you know, Zionist position. And so um, she was identified as somebody that we wanted to, you know, that they, you know, wanted to to really push her to sign on to this Cory Bush resolution that's in Congress right now for a ceasefire. And to really use the moment to uh, bring an acute, you know, acute amount of um, uh, um pressure against her to get her to sign this resolution to, you know, kick off hopefully more and more signatures, you know, to, to get Congress to move on this thing. Um, and so we went in there, uh, you know, and essentially it was uh, the Alliance, uh, you know, CJP, um, JVP and some other organizations who were part of it and some people who were. JVP for- is Jewish Voices for Peace. Right. Yeah. Okay. I'm so glad. And other organizations and, and people who were prepared to be arrested if need be. And uh, so we went in there and essentially, you know, um, kind of really organized fashion, had a couple of people hold the door. We went in, cameras, everything. Uh, the staff called the police. We were like, oh, we're not leaving until we get her on, you know, get her here. We, we know by her calendar that she's here. And it turned Turned out that there was just by clerical error, error, she was actually in D.C. at the time. We got her on the phone, you know, to try to push her to commit to signing the bill. She would not sign it. Although we did get, you know, uh, Hatam Abudaya, who's the um, who's uh, in, in USPCN, one of the. Um, He's the national uh, chair. He's uh, been a guest on Fight Back Radio, too. So <laughs> <laughs> another you. excellent interview. Uh, the national chair of USPCN got her to admit that uh, Palestinians have a right to to self defense, which was, was was an interesting moment. But of course, she wouldn't she wouldn't sign the bill. So we stayed. You know, what I mean, the police came and we stayed because you know, has she signed the bill yet? No. So we're not leaving. And uh, we got arrested. Seven of us were arrested. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, they they pressed charges. We we were you know. Um, well, this was quite a risk. I mean, it's like uh, um, we're, we're celebrating uh, that the Tampa Five just got their uh, um, charges dropped, but the repression against our movement is on the increase, and uh, especially with Palestine, you know, it seems that uh, you know more and more we're seeing uh, the state and you know governments take actions against the people you mentioned, uh, Alderman Silverstein's resolution in the city council, so. It's not without risk when you do these kind of sit-ins on behalf of Palestinians. So it's, you know, my hat's off. Oh, I mean, look, we were in Skokie, Illinois, which is, 
you know, there's a there's a lot of Zionists in Skokie. In fact, one another action that happened. Um, it's a northern suburb of Chicago. Yes, go ahead. Another action that we that uh, that was held. Um, uh, another a Zionist drove his car, you know, into the crowd trying to hit people. Um, a woman was banging on his windows. He got out of his car, chased her down. Um, and the crowd went to her defense. He pulled out a gun and started shooting around. And, uh, and this is, there was police right there. You know what I mean? He pulled out his gun and started shooting around, all that kind of stuff. He was arrested. And this was actually after another man came with military grade pepper spray and was pepper spraying people, including a police officer. Oh my God. And was, that was probably a mistake. But, uh... You're right. <laughs> but you know, like, they're just manic, you know, crazy, you know, whatever, psychotic. Yep you know, whatever. And, um, so he gets arrested. Um, and then this dude comes through his car, shoots into the air, he gets arrested. But then a couple of days later, the state's attorney's office refused to press charges, uh, or ret- refused to charge him saying that he was acting in self-defense when he came in, you know, uh, trying to attack people and was, uh, was arrested because he was shooting over people's heads. So, you know, it was just like this moment of just kind of like, you can see kind of like all these various, uh, you know, kinds of, uh, you know, um, forces within the city kind of conspiring to uh, to you know facilitate this shit. You know, all of this are different kind of manifestations of the facilitation of genocide at the end of the day. You know what I mean? Well, some of the, the resistance, too, some of the civil disobedience that's happened and the repression from the state to it, uh, is, it reminds me a, a little bit of the civil rights movement as well. And uh, <clears throat> there's often been a, a comparison um, to uh, uh, you know Jim Crow and uh, what's happening in uh, um, Palestine and the treatment of Palestinians uh, by you know w- within the state of Israel and then you know through occupation and other things, uh, do, do you think that that's a, a fair comparison? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, of course, I love your uh, journalistic approach to this, but yeah, of course, you know what I mean. Like it's uh, the the comparisons are are unfortunately you know. Um, limitless you know what i mean there's there's whole towns in the west bank you know where streets are cordoned off where you know uh, palestinians are not allowed to walk you know what i mean in their own homes you know what i mean in their own hometown israelis have come you know and if for and by military rule by military force you know have in, you know um uh created these these uh these racist kinds of uh social kinds of you know, policies mimicking, you know, uh, in total mimicry of, you know, U.S. Jim Crow laws. You know what I mean? They're not new. They're not like designing these things out of scratch. They're like literally in the same way that the Nazis were learning from American Jim Crow. You know, these Zionists are literally copying the playbook of the United States, you know, racist, white supremacist history. And, and, and um, you see it all over the West Bank. You know, you see it even in Gaza, you know what I mean? The uh, the parallels, you know, between, you know, Palestinian existence, you know, and, and uh, you know, existence of, of black people here in the United States is endless. You know, checkpoints, you know, the police brutality, even these these techniques, you know, it's, it's a lot of people are, are talking about it now. You know, thankfully, it's a well-known fact that United <clears throat> United States sends thousands of officers, you know, over to um, to Israel to be trained in you know these uh what they call it um i guess counterinsurgency tactics and techniques and policing in this type of environment and it's not only the police you know they i think nypd has a office they have a, a building in in uh israel but even the mayors you know like dc i'm from dc our mayor has gone you know to uh to israel to kind of learn from you know kind of their tactics there and, and, and they and the police they bring them back you know, George Floyd was killed by this, you know, knee on the neck technique that you see Israeli soldiers doing with such fluidity. You know what I mean? To children, to old men, you know, to women, you know, to to people of all ages, you know, as if it's just something that they practice day in, day out, day in, day out, day in, day out. You know what I mean? These just violent techniques on, on how to, you know, um, restrain, you know, innocent people or civilians. You know? Terrible. Yeah. And um and so, you know, they, uh, yeah, I mean, the parallels are endless, you know what I mean? And I think uh, it's also interesting just kind of how clear it was, 
not even now. I mean, now we see kind of this 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 deluge of support from you know black people for the Palestinians, but it's not new. You know what I mean? It, it goes all the way back, you know, to even like Malcolm X. You know, of course there there was there's a good amount of Zionism within the black community, unfortunately. You know what I mean? Early on, because they saw the parallels that they saw was you know between um, whatever part of the bible you know what i mean i forget the name of it but essentially the the, the jews kinds of you know escaping from um from egypt you know as like an allegory for black people you know kind of gaining you know freedom from slavery and things like that and i think that the vestiges of that that kind of association you know we still see it today in, in the black church you know who you know many are supporting uh, israel but you know in 1967 the student nonviolent coordinating committee put out an incredible article, which was like, did you know that this exists, you know, in Palestine, there is this military occupation, which has, you know, these kinds of, you know, characteristics, which, you know, look so much like what we experienced here in the United States. And they actually went into the history of its creation to, you know, the United States support and upholding of it to now, you know, to, you know, to all those things. And they wrote it in 67 in, in that in, in a extremely turbulent era, you know what I mean? Where they were up to their nose, noses in in kind of, you know, in in in, in this kinds of uh, in, a, in a social up, you know, kind of upheaval. And the, the newspaper itself reflects that it is a newspaper it is an article where the articles before it are about this police officer brutalized this person, this police officer brutalized that person, police attacks, police attacks, police, police crimes, police crimes, Palestine. And then goes on more again, police crimes, police crimes, police crimes. You know what I mean? So to oh them, God. it was yeah. so pertinent. You know, it was so relevant to what they were facing that they made special, you know, effort to include it in this article with such incredible detail. You know what I mean? And, um, and yeah, so it just kind of just shows, it shows you kind of the development of like this, you know, um, the, the black left really starting to start to draw these connections because they saw their face tied up you know, with the Palestinian liberation struggle. Let, let, let me ask you about another analogy that people have used, uh, <clears throat> which is uh, that of uh, South Africa. And so people have called uh, uh, Palestine, you know, Israel's occupation of Palestine apartheid. Um, and uh, that's uh, clearly, uh, to me, it's clearly a reference to uh, uh, South Africa, which uh, declared their uh, um, government an apartheid separate government uh, in 1948. Um, but I, I mean, it goes back, I don't know how far it goes back. I know Jimmy Carter even called his book, uh, uh, something like apartheid, uh, used that word in the title to, to describe what was going on. And so, uh, but also some of the tactics that the Palestinians have used in terms of international solidarity, calling for, a, a boycott, divestiture and sanctions is very similar to, um, I remember, uh, uh when I was young and in, in, in college, uh, in the late 70s and early 80s, we uh, called for a, a divestiture of the universities uh, from uh, corporations that did business in South Africa. And all these things called attention to what was going on in South Africa. And ultimately, uh, there was a, uh, you know, a success. Apartheid uh, was, was ended. And, uh, you know, recently, uh, Nelson Mandela's grandson came here to Chicago and was part of a national tour to, to raise this issue as well and to speak out. Um, in favor of the Palestinians. Uh, do you think this is a, a fair analogy? And uh, do you think this is a good tactic of uh, you know, this uh, boycott, divestiture, sanctions? Yeah, I mean, I, it's one of the it's one of the prongs, you know, of the of the of their approach. And I think that like the fact that the United States government is trying to outlaw or has outlawed it in several states just kind of shows you how you know, how effective it is. But you know, also just the fact that, um, like you said, you know, South African apartheid kicking off in, you know, in 1948 and really kind of materializing 49, 50, you know, and then going on, you know, for another 50 years that to us was clearly, you know, 50 years too long. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Um, it went on for an extremely long time. And then to then kind of contextualize that, it's like this broader history that, Palestinians, you know, 1948 being the year of the of the Nakba, you know, the catastrophe where, you know, the, the uh, state of Israel was born or attempted to be, you know, so-called state of Israel was born um, and has existed 30 years longer than even that. 
You know what I'm saying? Yep. And uh, it's just kind of, you know, because, of course, of its uh, undying support by the United States and also, um, you know, the rest of the, you know, the people who benefit from its existence and uh, its um, ability with all of its, you know, all of the people who help it to do this, its ability to really control the narrative around itself. You know what I mean? They were able to really stay hidden in many ways a lot longer, you know, than South African apartheid was. And it was really around this battleground, this additional battleground of, you know, kind of who controls the narrative and who's able to kind of propagate the myths and stories that we tell around uh, about this place. But like what we're seeing now is this incredible overthrowing of the mainstream media's ability to control that narrative you know, because of social media, um, where everyday Palestinians on the ground, you know, embroiled in this heroic struggle to tell their stories, you know what I mean, are being, are so effectively doing it. You know, it's, it's essentially what we've seen is, you know, the Palestinian liberation struggle, um, forcing the world's attention, uh, away from the mainstream media to its own homebred, you know, journalists, you know what I'm saying? Homebrew journalists on the ground there to say, no, actually, this is what's happening. And that, you know, of course, through decades of, of real struggle, you know, now really being, you know, finding such efficacy now is one of the most kinds of, I think, one of the most critical aspects of, you know, kind of what we're seeing today in this sea change of popular opinion. And the fact that they did it, you know, um, the fact that they defeated Israel at their own game, you know what I mean, which they're so have been up to this point so good at, you know, so effective at being able, you know, to control the narrative, is really just a um, a testament to the the power of the of this, you know, of this movement that we're seeing around, you know, around Palestine. And yeah, I think that, uh, there's no question. You're right. I'm sorry. Go on. I yeah, you know what I mean. And it. Um, it, it also, you know, it, it's both, it's, it's that and also the fact that Israel, just by existing as a racist, you know, apartheid state is, you know, kinds of, is just doing the things that is ultimately, you know, causing people to, to, um, to kind of develop these, you know, to take on these ideas about it, you know, as a, as a racist state, as a white supremacist state. So, you know, it's, it's, um it's just an incredible moment to kind of, to, to be alive. And I think that like, um, it's also incredible to kind of see the inter interplay between 2020, you know, our accomplishments in 2020 and the Palestinians accomplishments now, you know, and the way that they, they build on each other, you know what I mean? Because of course the, the media has made mistakes that they will never recover from, you know what I'm saying? The mainstream media will never recover from this moment. You know, these politicians will never recover from this moment. And by that, I mean, you know, in our own struggles, you know, in the black liberation struggle, all these gains are going to serve us in the future. You know what I mean? All this work that's been done to um, to uh, demystify, you know, the mainstream media, you know what I mean? To take away their power over the narrative, you know, to demystify and to, to clarify the role of politicians. It's going to serve. Our, it is serving already all of our struggles. You know what I mean? Because we can point to the victories made now by this Palestinian struggle. You know, to say, look, the media lies to you. We knew it. We knew it kind of, kind of, sort of. But now it's clear. It's obvious. And everybody agrees. You know, look, the politicians don't actually care. You actually don't have any democratic say in the society. You know what I mean? They actually will genocide somebody for money. You know what I mean? They will actually send billions of dollars to a place while their own people starve, you know, have no access to health care, have no housing. You know what I mean? While prices are, you know, inflating beyond belief and, you know, people are drowning in debt. You know what I mean? Let, let me ask you a little bit about, uh, I know, um, uh, you know, in, in the aftermath of a World War II, when we were talking about that, that's when the, the Nakba happened, the founding of the State of Israel. Um, for that matter, also the, the, the start of apartheid in South Africa. And, and there were things in both cases that led up to that. Those things didn't uh, drop from the sky. But uh, at, at the same time here in the United States, uh, uh, people like uh, Paul Robeson and uh, uh, William Patterson, uh, prominent uh, black leaders of the black liberation movement here in the United States, were 
um, approaching the, the brand newly formed at that time uh, United Nations and calling for, uh, they said they had a thing called We Call Genocide, and they had a petition. They were talking about genocide against black people here in the United States. Um, and, uh, um, I mean, I think there's been a, you know, you've talked a little bit here about how, uh, you know, the jo- George Floyd uh, um, uh, rebellion uh, and, uh, the, and the woman who took the photo of him being killed, uh, uh, you know, exposed him and uh, all the people in Palestine with their, you know, their, their phones and whatever that the, so, you know, that are able to, because of the internet, get this stuff out and expose them. But, um, uh, I, I guess what I'm asking, I, I want to go back to, uh, the United Nations maybe, uh, in this time, uh, uh, in the middle of the 20th century when, uh, and it, it's evolved, you know, so it's become a tool. I mean, I think, uh, uh, Patterson and, uh, Robeson were exposing the United Nations. Malcolm X did the same thing a few years later, um, by, uh, taking the, uh, organization of, uh, um, uh, uh, African states and encouraging them to go to the United Nations. And uh, could you talk a little bit about the United Nations and what's how this current battle in Palestine is playing out there and your thoughts about the what can be won or not won there? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. You know, first, that I, I'd say that, like, um, in the process of, like, snatching the mic, you know, from the mainstream media, you know, this Palestinian liberation movement has not handed it to like celebrity figures or whatever, you know, it is regular people on the ground. Like you said, the sister who recorded George Floyd and set off the whole, you know, uprising was a, a sister, you know what I'm saying? Going to the, the convenience store after work or, or whatever, you know, like a regular sister, you know, who happened to have a phone on her that day. And um, that's the other aspect about this, you know, this kind of, this kind of, um, you know, um, narrative revolution that we're seeing you know um i just wanted to point that out but but also i'll just say that regarding the un you know we could even go back before the un you know to the league of nations which was its first manifestation after world war one you know this um this whole idea of collective security you know manifested in these western nations saying oh shit we just killed a lot of people maybe you know to keep that from happening again let's kind of you know, create this League of Nations, which will allow us to just kind of, you know, talk it out before we resort to, to warfare, you know, kind of thing. And, or at least that was kind of the rhetoric around it. In 1935, Italy, who's a member of the League of Nations, you know, sees the rise of Mussolini, um, partially on the promise of, of uh, invading and colonizing Ethiopia, because 40 years previous, they had uh, been the only European nation to be defeated by an African nation in uh, the Battle of Ottawa when they, the first time they tried to invade Ethiopia. And uh, so for 40 years, you know, they were kind of um, brooding around this and they saw it as just a, a total kind of, you know, a, a defeat that they had to avenge. Otherwise, what kind of society are we if we can't beat some Africans? And so he came to power on that promise. But the only thing about it is that Ethiopia was also a member of the League of Nations, you know, and at the time, Emperor Haile Selassie had all the faith in the, in the world that the League of Nations would like stop this invasion from happening. But actually what happened was um, Britain, or let's say the UK and France, especially, were conspiring in conjunction with Italy in, in every way possible to facilitate the invasion of Ethiopia to allow Italy to take it. Because to them, it was a way to protect their colonial holdings in the region. You know, better it go to a, another um, white, you know, to another European nation to be colonized by another European nation rather than to stay free and incite rebellion in our, you know, colonial states, our colonial holdings, you know, because um, Somali was French and European, divi- uh, French divided by the French and British. and um, you know, Egypt was British and, you know, uh, Sudan as well. You know what I mean? And so it was just some of the things that they did. For example, the um, the French held a shipment of weapons that were headed for Ethiopia. They had uh, a port in, in Djibouti that these weapons had to go through. The French held the shipment to give the Italians enough time to, you know, to get, 
you know, to 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 uh, march deeper, you know, in, deep enough to be able to get a hold of, you know, to deep, you know, to give them a head start on their invasion. And then they let the shipment go. And of course, the weapons fell into into Italian hands, you know, and um, left the uh, the Ethiopians basically defenseless. You know, what I mean, of course, they put up a fight and, and Italians had to use poison gas to win the war. It's the whole thing. But um, the interesting thing about it was those weapons were bought from the Germans because no other European nation would sell Ethiopian weapons because they didn't want Ethiopia to be able to fight back against the Italians. And so it was just this whole you know, historical moment that exposed the League of Nations for what it was, which is just a good old boys club for white, you know, Western nations to be able to further colonize the planet and deepen their control of, you know, over the over the over Africa, Asia and, and Latin America. You know what I mean? And so, um, so, so do you see um, I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you see uh, uh, the United Nations uh, in the same kind of vein? So Palestine is doing it's playing the same historical function right now as Ethiopia did in the past by exposing the United Nations as literally just a little playground for the United States to be able to facilitate its imperial domination of the planet. By one vote, they, they could veto a whole attempt by the entire planet to say this genocide can't proceed further. You know what I mean? They could they could torpedo, you know, a ceasefire with just one vote. What what kind of, you know, what kind of body is that and what kind of democracy is that? It's actually not at all. And so to me, that the International Criminal Court, you know, if this is not genocide by their definition, then what what purpose, what use do they serve? And certainly these questions will survive beyond this moment where people will be asking, what do you actually provide? You know, what do you serve in this? You know, what purpose do you serve in, in, in this world? And are you actually necessary? You know, and I think that these will be important experiences for us to, you know, to um, that we will learn from and grow from in our kind of future estimations of like what needs to happen, you know, uh, moving forward when, you know, of course, one day the power is in our hands. And I think, um, and I think that the, uh, you know, um, it's, it, it, again, the, the gift of clarity that the Palestine liberation struggle is, is gifting to the whole planet is going, is, is sowing seeds that will be bearing fruit for decades to come. And that's again, once again, you know, the reason why everybody has to be involved, you know, and, um, yeah, I think, um, yeah, I'll leave that question. Right yeah, so, so I mean, what you seem to be saying is that the United Nations and, and probably many of these international organizations of, uh, you know, trade, defense, and everything else are are, are tools of uh, of the imperial countries for to uh, you know for to have national oppression, and racist national oppression, on uh, on the third world. And if I'm right, I, I think you're also saying that that that's the same forces that are um, oppressing black people in the United States. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, <laughs> no, but I'll also add that in the case of Ethiopia, the, um, the only people who were really, you know, mobilizing mass support for Ethiopia was the black diaspora. You know what I mean? It was African-Americans and black people in the Caribbean, you know, yep. they were, they were burning down um, Italian storefronts, you know, who were, you know, Italians who were basically supporting fascist Italy, you know what I mean? And uh, they were sending people to go fight. They were signing up people to go fight. They were raising money to send weapons, you know? And to me, that just kind of harkens to this moment now where, you know, black people are so up in arms around what's happening in Palestine because black people don't need much information. The only black people you see supporting Israel are black people who have no information. But the moment they get even an uh, inkling, you know, of the of the conditions and relations that are happening, you know, what's going on in Palestine, they know immediately that they stand with Palestine and stand against Israel. You know what I mean? That they stand against the Zionists, you know, the, any way it expresses itself, you know, around the, around the planet. And so, you know, to me, that's just kind of like the, you know, the seed of, of rebellion that's kind of been implanted in us by our own historical experiences at the hands of, again, U.S. imperial domination, you know, of the planet. No, that's good. That's good. I appreciate that. So, um, uh, unfortunately, we're, we're starting to, to come to the end of our interview. And so uh, um, I've, I, this has been great. Uh, I, I enjoyed, uh, you know, hearing your perspective on Palestine. 
Um, and uh, I, I've, you know, clearly I've enjoyed, uh, you know, your reels and your social media, but to get a, a whole uh, a whole hour or so of, uh, of, uh, of Marawi uh, Garima was, uh, is, is much better than the, the short clips. <laughs> so we appreciate that. Um, is there anything you want to add that we uh, haven't covered here or anything, any points you want to raise? Yeah, I mean, no, nah, I would just say anybody who's who's, you know, wanting to to also take up the struggle along with whatever it is you got going on, I would say follow, you know, do your best to seek out the Palestinian leadership near you. You know what I'm saying? Um, USPCN is the uh, organization here in Chicago, really moving and shaking a lot of the things. CJP, the coalition, as we said, you know, of Palestinian leadership here in Chicago. Um, they're in, on the West Coast as well um, and around the country. And um, but there are more organizations, you know, who are also doing, um, you know, who are also leading. You know, there are more Palestinian leadership organizations out there. And, and I think that um, essentially what I'm saying is I would encourage people to find a way to get involved. You know, as, as has been said before, you know, genocide is a global priority and it takes everybody working you know, at their best you know, um, to their, to their fullest potential, you know, to really bring it to an end. And so, um, and, um, and you don't have to invent the wheel. There are people who have been fighting this struggle for 75 years, you know, that's how mature the liberation struggle is, you know, if not more than that. And so, um, we do our best work by following, following the leadership of those who have their feet to the fire, you know, like, uh, Frank Chapman said, and, um, right now the Palestinians have their feet to the fire. In 2020, it was us, and right now it's them. So uh, it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, it's it's the front line of the struggle for uh, for national liberation and against imperialism right now. No question about it. Um, so thank you uh, for being our guest on Fight Back Radio, Marawi. This has been a, a real joy. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Marawi Garima. Uh, so yeah, thank you, uh, Marawi. That was a. Uh, insightful and, and, and provocative. I, I think uh, it, it should get people thinking about, uh, you know, the interconnection of different liberation struggles that are out there and, and you know, how our enemies uh, try to divide us and use things against each other. And so uh, um, I encourage you to, uh, to get involved in this. Uh, right now, the front line of the struggle is uh, what's going on in Palestine, as Marawi has told us. And uh, so there's marches, there's programs, there's things to do, there's boycott, divest, sanctions, there's, you know, you know, you can raise a resolution in your union. Uh, all these things are, are things that we should be thinking about doing and how we can support uh, the people in Palestine, because uh, when they win, we win. I think that's the bottom line here. And so uh, I want to encourage people to do those kinds of things. Also, uh, I want to, uh, you know, remind people of uh, Marawi's a filmmaker. I check out his... Uh, his movie on Netflix, it's called Residue, so I, I think you'll enjoy that. It's uh, It deals with issues of uh, gentrification in, uh, in Washington, D.C., actually, so uh, I think you'll you'll like that. Um, but uh, as I said, we, you know, we want to encourage people to get involved. We also want to encourage our listeners to, to share this out, tell other people about it. Um, you know, the way we, we, we grow and we've continued to grow. I want to thank everybody that has been sharing, uh, fight back radio episodes and posting it on social media. And we've had a steady growth for our, you know, a little under two years now. And, uh, um, you know, on all the social media platforms. So we, we thank you for that. Um, but we want you to continue, you know, try to continue to do that and, uh, you know, let people know about what we're doing. If you want to reach us, in the show notes, we'll put all the, you know, how you can reach uh, Fight Back Radio. But uh, the email is uh, richard.fightbackradio at gmail.com. And uh, I, I always appreciate, uh, I look at every one of the emails and I appreciate all the comments that we've gotten from you and advice and criticism. So thank you all for that. Um, also, give us a review, uh, give us a thumbs up or five stars or whatever it is, all the kind of interaction with the, uh, the platform, whether it's uh, iTunes or Spotify or whoever you're listening to it on YouTube, all those things help uh, raise us in the algorithm. And uh, um, especially, uh, you know, as news is starting to reach us that uh, there's been censorship and uh, suppression of the Palestinian issues, we need people to 
to probably do that more than ever. So that's a way of uh, a way of resistance is uh, supporting Fight Back Radio. So thank you for that. Um, and then finally, uh, um, I want to thank our, our crack production team, which uh, you know who makes this all happen. Uh, Vince Olson, Shane Tremley, Natalie Pranis, and Dodd McColgan. And I'm Richard Berg for the entire Fight Back Radio team saying until next time, all power to the people.